how many people here know what AppNexus is, just out of curiosity? Got, all right, okay, fair number. So uh, just real quick, I know we're here for tech, but it's maybe relevant to understand what we do. Um, we are an advertising technology company, so we license technology to big companies uh, like Microsoft, like eBay, um, like Orange is a global telco. Um, and what we do uh, is help these companies shift from a traditional negotiated hand-sold world where um, buyers and sellers of media, so publishers, websites who are trying to make money and they're talking to advertisers, the traditional way is just hand negotiated. People do big bulk deals by millions and millions and millions of ads at flat rates um, and doing that in real time. So basically doing it programmatically um, on page load, actually holding an auction, um, having a, a real time bidding process where people bid on those ad impressions um, and then clearing that actual auction. So we license technology that lets people operate ad exchanges, trading businesses, trade desks, um, and we work with companies across the entire spectrum, so it's just full technology company. Um, and so what's cool is, uh, this actually should be 50, not 500 milliseconds, so on page load, we actually in 50 milliseconds will do these auctions. And you may not know this, but there's a lot of ads on the internet these days. Um, so we do this about 800,000 times a second at peak time. Uh, so I don't think we're at peak time now, we're kind of dipping down. But this afternoon, I could have said, hey, you know, in the last five seconds, we saw X million users. Um, and actually saw X million ads. Um, and we've been going through this five year kind of roller coaster, which has been quite a ride. <laughs> we started, we thought 10,000 ads a second was a big deal. Um, we hit 100,000 and I think a year later hit 250,000. And um, the, the Y axis is actually a little off. Our metric system tends to average down. So the, actually the end peak here is 800. And Facebook just got into the real time advertising, launching Facebook ad exchange. We license technology that helps people buy on Facebook Ad Exchange. It's one of the things we do, and you can see a nice little fun peak when they start doing that. Um, so yeah, so we serve lots and lots and lots of ads, um, and we have really thousands and thousands of servers to actually do this. So as you can imagine, if you're doing 800,000 requests a second, that you need a fair amount of hardware to do that. We generate 10 to 15 terabytes of data every single day. Um, so just pretty crazy numbers. Um, and today, I just want to talk to you about how we manage um, uh, what I call DevOps, which I, I've gotten into debates, is DevOps like religion or is it you know, team function? Um, I think it's a function, not a religion, but I think there's religious aspects to us if you want. Um, and so, uh, <laughs> talk to you about how we actually manage deployments and how, how we manage our infrastructure. Now, some of you might say, hey, we don't have 3,000 servers, so that's true, but I think none of that matters. The principles here are what's important. Um, the investment and the reward from being able to do what um, I will actually show you live, which I think is a lot more fun. Um, so uh, our DevOps systems, uh, we call our main system is called Maestro. And uh, Maestro is a, uh, it's a API driven application. So basically uh, we have a, a central server that runs um, and you, it's a standard RESTful API framework where you can actually post different you know, tasks to it. Um, and well, obviously one of the main tasks is to kick off different runbooks or different jobs. Um, and I'll show the UI in a second, but what was cool is first we actually built this UI. So we took kind of standard software engineering practices, right? Um, most DevOps starts with just kind of hacking things together. Um, and then, you know, when we built on the third version of this, we decided to treat it like a software application that we could deploy and hand to our customers. That was kind of the philosophy. And thus, we went with that service-oriented architecture and API. And what's cool is our engineers very quickly said, we don't like UIs to do deployments, and they wrote their own command line deployment script. So I'm just going to do a deployment of our um, HBI application. Um, it's a front end. And all it did was it took uh, tag 1.21.27 and said, deploy this to prod. And here you can now see a status of that actual upgrade. Um, it's silencing Nagios because some alerts may fire when certain upgrades are happening. Um, it's running Puppet. We do use Puppet for our deployments. And you can actually go and see all the details of what this is actually doing. You can run the, see the commands that it's actually running. Um, you can see actually this is the API call that was generated uh, for the specific instances. Um, and this is how our engineers do their deployments day in, day out. Um, now, in this case, I only showed you deployment on four actual servers. This will take about a minute, so we'll just let it run. Um, but, you know, as you can imagine, we also, I'm not going to deploy our ad servers right now. That's not, the ad server team would just kill me. <laughs> some of you may want me to do it, but <laughs> I'll show you some other stuff. But uh, our, you can also, we've integrated all of this into our metrics. So inside of our monitor, this is a, an ad server release that happened earlier today. 
Um, it was completed on 91 servers. Uh, for some reason, it was aborted, so something went wrong with the, the release. Um, and you can see that the AdServer team has uh, metrics that they're watching as the release is going, and then you can actually see across all of those different servers, see what's actually happening, follow the releases, they'll get standard out. So this instance was upgraded successfully. Um, pretty much everything you need to manage servers in bulk. Um, but it's also not just releases that we do on here. Uh, we also have, um, for example, uh, our SATS dashboard. So for uh, doing, managing kind of our production infrastructure, we obviously, we're a 24-7 business, 365. Um, this is a real-time snapshot of um, basically our four core real-time applications. So this is the apps that have to deal with this 800,000 QPS. And this is pulled, it's a 10 second delay. Um, it's a back end that sits and runs and actually does real time updates. So when we're firefighting, you can actually go see what's going on. And NYM1, there's a couple boxes down. I don't know why, there's no necessarily, for us a couple boxes down isn't a big deal. But then of course what's really cool is that you can then actually go do things with these servers. So I can go filter and take all my NYM boxes and then apply a runbook to them, which can be restart the servers, it can be upgrade, it can be run a TCP dump, it can be any of these kind of things. Um, and all of this is a completely scriptable framework. So what's cool is that all of our engineers start and actually write their own scripts to do things. Um, and I'll show you real quick how that actually works. So all of these scripts are, are scripts that our actual individual engineering teams can deploy to production. So basically, uh, our DevOps or our ops team is being removed from critical path for being able to manage production. And the way we treat it, all of our engineers own their own code in production. That's our kind of golden rule. And the reason why is, you know, when our ops person gets paid for someone else's shitty code, the shitty code doesn't get fixed. When the engineer gets paid for his own shitty code, it turns out he fixes his shitty code, um, which is why we actually do this. Um, but what's cool is, you know, these, these are scripts. You can actually go and look at the source, and here's a sample script that, you know, we're not going to run through all of this, but you can just go and edit these scripts and build scripts to basically manage production, which you can then, of course, share with others, and they can take dynamic input, and we can do all sorts of fun stuff. And then I'll show you one more thing before we talk about how we got here, which is, you know, the team also went off and said, um, hey, let's actually go build some command line tools that help us manage production. So someone wrote a tool called, called mFind, and he said, hey, I want a tool to find production impression bus boxes. So this is an API call to Maestro and says, hey, give me all boxes that are impression buses. It's our front end application. Um, and then he said, well, hey, you know, um, let me add some more filters to this. So I want to be able to pull things that are only serving ads for a Google Ad Exchange. We split out these boxes for some technical reasons in terms of how they manage DNS. Details don't really matter. And then someone's like, well, hey, what if we actually let you actually do commands on those boxes? So I can actually go and do an mexec, which means I'm going to you know, take these uh, boxes serving ad traffic, and I can go call them and see how they're doing. Uh, and I think I need a dash S here. Um, and this will actually go off and calls Maestro, does a job, and says, oh, here's the status from these boxes. And then another engineer got bored and said, well, that's not very pretty, so let's add a pretty call to our command line, and now you can get the status of all these boxes prettyified. Um, so it, it's really fun what engineers start doing once you give them these APIs, right? So taking that API-driven approach that you might take to your standard web application, taking them to your production systems, suddenly opens up actually a whole world of innovation. And what's awesome is our DevOps guys can actually really focus on writing better um, DevOps systems, not on just writing yet another script or yet another tool to actually do this. Let's go back to a little bit of slideware. Um, so how did we actually get here, right? So um, I looked up on Wikipedia before this, um, and this is what Wikipedia defines as DevOps. It's software engineering mixed with quality assurance and technical operations. Um, I didn't think this was a very good definition, so I went on Google, and DevOps Borat is actually much better at defining DevOps, which is that to make error is human, to propagate error to all servers in an automatic way is DevOps. Um, and anyone who's managed production application knows that it's true. Um, and so one really important thing for me is that DevOps is not just a new name for your sysadmin team. Um, there are certainly companies out here that have just renamed sysadmins to DevOps. Um, if you would like to sex up your sysadmin team, you can call them site reliability engineers. Um, that's a nice sexy name. I think Google uses that for their sysadmin team. Um, but no, DevOps really is, in my mind, a function. Right? There is certainly a certain religion, we'll talk about that in a little bit, but it, it, you really, if you want internal tools that really help you manage production, you need to staff people against that. Right? So the hardest part we found towards this is actually finding the right people. 
Um, so when we, when we first started, uh, we had our sysadmin team. Um, and we told our sysadmin team, hey, build tools to automate your job, right? Um, and they went out and they used kind of a couple off-the-shelf tools like Puppet and things like that. Uh, and then they wrote some code. Now, the only problem is that, and well, are there sysadmins in the room? One, one, I'm sorry for what I'm about to say. Um, so <laughs> the problem with sysadmins is they're really good at you know, getting something from state A to state B you know, once, right? Fantastic, you need that done. And you know, often they can write a script to do that, and, and they can do that, and that script will work 90% of the time, right? Because generally that script's written off of hair on fire, and it's busy, and oh my god, we need that release tomorrow, no one thought about looping in the ops guy. And so what your ops team is generally good at is getting stuff done very quickly, right? But the accuracy of what they do tends to be a little bit lower. It's not that they're not good engineers, it's just their skill set is optimized towards now, fast, ASAP, please. And what that means is that most code you're going to get out of your ops team works 90% of the time. And you've all seen this, right? You want to do a release, you tell your ops guy, you're trying to do a release, maybe you have a script to do it, and well, one out of 10 times it fails, and you, you, you kind of ping him on IM, or you text him, and he's like, oh, gold on, give me a minute. And I've got to be type some magic commands, and then suddenly the release goes through, and he's like, ah, oh, I fixed it, and it's good. You know? and, and well, did anyone have that experience here? No, you didn't? You didn't have it? All right, good, you're a good system. <laughs> but, but seriously, this happens all the time. And the problem is when you start dealing with lots and lots of applications or lots and lots of deployments, right? So deploying small changes frequently is much better than bundling them all together. You want to release as little as possible, as often as possible, because you'll break as little as possible when, you, if, when inevitably you push out bad code, and you'll know immediately what the bad code was. If you've got 100 features, you push them together, you'll never know kind of what broke what, right? But to do that, you need to release all the time. And if it's only going to work 90% of the time, well, you're in trouble because you're going to be constantly pinging your ops guy. Um, and so ops guy, not the right guy to write your DevOps system because he doesn't have quite the experience. Um, so the, on the flip side, when we asked engineers to do it, engineers had no clue how to manage production. Right? Engineers kind of live in these lofty dreams. We all do this. I'm like half ops, half engineer. I'm, bad engineer and bad ops, and somehow in the middle it works a little bit. Um, but the, the engineers tend to kind of want to write perfect systems, and, and they don't think about kind of all the things that the ops people think about, about the, the OS and the hardware and the network and the switches, and kind of all the things you need to be able to be a good sysadmin. So finding that right uh, DevOps guy, I think he looks like this, and I think that's a bazooka. I'm not sure. This is the automator from the Mac. I don't know if you guys know. But um, so finding it is actually really hard. Um, and so what we found is that what we had to do is actually do rotational programs. So we took engineers and we had them do some ops, right? And we took some ops people and they did a few rotations in engineering. And once you start have done both jobs, you end up in a situation where you can actually write good, repeatable code that has you know unit tests, crazy idea, you know tested code, documented. Um, in SVN, oh, crazy idea, also a good idea. Um, and then on the other side, you can also have people have that, that firefighting experience. So having people do kind of ride-alongs. We'll have engineers do ride-alongs with the ops team and take pagers and see how people do that firefighting. Basically turning the engineer almost into a product manager right, for what the ops guy is doing helped get that knowledge. But just getting the right people uh, was actually not enough. Um, we had to do two other things, uh, which were actually really critical. The first was you cannot have your DevOps guys sit on pager, right? They cannot be in line of fire. They cannot take ops tickets because the problem was their mandate was to build the best internal tools possible. But hold on. Oh, crap. We all know the rule of ops, right? There's always a queue. It always has more tickets than you want in it. So there's always work you're not doing. And that guilt factor, and then there's the people pinging you on IM, and then there's a person whose release broke. You end up never finding those uninterrupted blocks of time that you need to write great code. Um, so actually splitting off a couple people and having them be dedicated to this, having them be out of line of fire, was critical. We did not start making serious progress until we did that. Um, and the second part goes back to the kind of DevOps as a religion. The getting the, and now we're, you know, we're right now a 350 person company, tech team is about 150 something. Um, so we might have different problems than you know, four guys in a room. But for us, and we started doing this when we were probably a 60 person tech team, and even at that size, it was hard to get people to collaborate because you know everyone's got their own hat on, everyone's got their problems, everyone's got kind of what they're focused on. But getting, um, we assumed that if we built it, then people would use it. We built this fantastic API-driven framework and had scripting languages and all of this, and no engineering team was using it. They wrote their own scripts. 
Um, and so actually the internal advocacy and then having our DevOps guys do ride-alongs with individual engineering teams and showing them how the tools would help them turn out to be actually really critical as well. Um, so don't underestimate, I mean, number one thing I can say just from CTO to you is like if you want to accomplish this, people is the first thing that matters and getting the right people, getting them aligned properly, right, and then having them communicate and advocate what they're doing, um, that's, you know, at a very high level critical to actually getting this to be successful. So let's dive in kind of a little bit more technically perhaps. So we got the people in the right room, we got them focused on the right problem, we got them talking to the right people, um, and it was critical to treat this like engineering. I talked a little bit about 10% failure rates, but we had to treat this like an engineering team. Technically, for cultural and collaboration reasons, they actually live inside of our kind of infrastructure operations organization, but they're treated to engineering, they have a dotted line into engineering, they're expected to have the same level of quality, the same level of bug control uh, that our engineering teams do, um, so that we have a system that can actually work across 3,000 servers. Because imagine, even if I get my accuracy from 90% to 99.9%, if I'm deploying on 1,000 servers, it means every deploy something goes wrong, right? We really need real testable code that actually works. Um, or as DevOps Borat would tell us, bad code is a liability in six months and good code is only a liability after 36 months. Um, and I, by the way, does anyone agree with this? Yeah? Nobody? Really? You think your code is good for, for more than 36 months? I totally disagree. <laughs> we find like weird stuff. We're like, oh, I coded that three years ago. Um, so testable, repeatable code, um, uh, same rigor of engineering tools. We talked about this. Um, and you know the goal of the sysadmin is really to re replace uh, itself with a small shell script, right? That script that works 90% of the time. And a DevOps is that RESTful API, and that's kind of a lot of what we did in, uh, on our side here. Um, so one thing that's, the last thing I think that was critical to us being successful was actually using open source effectively. Um, if you want to build everything from scratch, uh, you're, there's just too much, right? You need monitoring, you need metrics, you need production management. The reason we built Maestro is because we found that in terms of production management, actually kind of pushing and all of these, that's where there was not much. We started this before Chef even existed, so there's better tools out there that you could use that might be good enough in terms of Chef and Knife. Um, but so definitely use open source tools. Um, you know, Nagios, I hate it to death. It's one of the worst monitoring tools in existence, but it's the only one, and you know, it seems to be better than building your own, so use it, right? Um, Gangula is pretty good for metrics. Uh, we love Graphite, but they have no logo, so it's kind of hard to throw them up here. Uh, <laughs> they really go to Graphite website. There's actually just kind of plain text, but fantastic tool. Um, and then we also have uh, Puppet is a really, really great tool, especially for managing configurations and operating system level stuff. Um, and so using these tools, definitely, definitely use them. Don't reinvent every single wheel. But if you do use them, don't just treat it as software. You know, don't treat it like the ops guy might by default, which is install the software, type up your Puppet config, kind of, and, and go, right? Um, and I don't know how many people here use Puppet. How, how many people here use Puppet? Let me just do a quick survey. Actually, fair enough. How many people have you versioned your Puppet configurations? About half, right? This is critical. You have to treat Puppet like you would a software release. You're deploying a script that's going to change your entire production environment. It's funny, when we first started using Puppet, and I, don't, I still think they haven't quite uh, uh, fixed this just yet, we actually have different Puppet iterations and different Puppet code sources inside of our Maestro tool so that you can actually upgrade from one Puppet recipe to the next. So you have to treat Puppet like an automated piece of tool where you tag a release and you deploy it, right? Um, and you can actually use automation to do that, right? You can't, has, can't be a manual SCP, a new file over here, right? So use these tools this way as well. Your monitoring system, it should be automatic. If you spool up a new server, this shouldn't be, hey, I have to configure a monitoring to work. Because if you do it, if you require people to do things, they will fail naturally, maybe 10% of the time during the day and 30% of the time at night, right? So if there's that pager at night, you know, they will make mistakes. So automate the monitoring, automate the metrics. And on our side, any server we spool up, it's a point and click to, to spool up a server. I highly recommend you build that, especially if you're going to have any kind of scale. And then when that server is spooled up, it automatically has the application, it's monitored, and we got metrics. Um, really, really critical. So, and we even have staging. We have a staging environment for our puppet. We have a total dev environment for our puppet where our ops team can go play with new tools and new recipes. Uh, we roll those releases. Uh, very, very helpful. So last thing, and let's see if the internet works to actually do this so I can show you guys a little live demo. Um, uh, one thing I find consistently that almost every company 
underinvest in is metrics. Um, so uh, we use Graphite for all of our metrics. It's a fantastic tool. We sponsored a lot of development. I don't know if you use the dashboarding UI. It came from the fact that we had so many metrics that Graphite wasn't working for us. Um, so we worked closely with Chris to get him to build this. Um, we had actually built our own kind of shitty PHP version. didn't quite work. We wanted to get integrated. All the aggregations and cluster stuff, we also worked closely with Chris on. Um, and, you know, our team, this is, we still need to improve this, but we now have, you know, dashboards that show real production status for pretty much anything we have in production um, at any point in time. Um, and everyone in the company is religious about this, from our CEO down to every single engineer. Every engineering team has a dashboard for their application. Our services teams now have, have dashboards for their individual clients. So we're a B2B company. So since we our clients name in the hundreds, we actually track in real time how many impressions our clients are sending us, how much money they're spending. And our actual services people, because we've automated pagers integrated to, with metrics, we didn't intend this to happen, but they then started putting themselves on pager for their own accounts. So now our monitoring system sends pages to our services engineers and, and our uh, implementation consultants when their accounts do unexpected behavior, when volume drops, things like that, which lets our services team now deliver a fantastic service that they call our clients and sometimes they tell them their site sites are down, right, before our clients sometimes know, um, which is pretty crazy, right? So <laughs> you imagine you call, you're like, hey, you know, we stopped seeing traffic from your account, like what's going on? It's like, really? Oh, oh shit, our site's down. Um, it kind of feels good to be able to do that, those kind of phone calls. So I really, really highly recommend um, getting a really solid metric system and integrating that closely with your monitoring so that you can just have all of this be seamless so you have visibility to what happens, which matters more and more, especially as you get big. You know, when you have five servers, you can log in five servers, see what's going on. When you have three and a half thousand servers, there's no way. And when you're Facebook and you have, I don't know how many, umpteen hundred thousand servers, I'm sure you, know, you have to have some kind of way to look at these metrics. Uh, programmatically.